Hi all, Rick here again and this is part of the early Federation series where we delve into different aspects of the Star Trek galaxy around the Enterprise era and the formation of the UFP. This time we're looking at how the books detailed the survival of Trip Tucker. So spoilers ahead too, I, I guess. I'm not a huge fan of bringing back characters from the dead in most things, unless it's been telegraphed as a possibility ahead of the resurrection. Star Trek has seen all types of explained resurrections and fakeouts over the years, some even played for laughs, at times such as the many clones of Wayoon. Spock's resurrection in the search for Spock was foreshadowed by the transference of his Katra and the fact that he was literally dropped on a planet that creates and accelerates life. Into Darkness, however, in a flip of the Wrath of Khan, did a poor attempt of bringing back Kirk, waving its hand and saying that magic augment DNA was the cure for even death. For me, that latter was taking it a little too far, despite the augment DNA being foreshadowed to have regenerative properties. I get it was probably just supposed to cure the radiation while McCoy resuscitated him, but that's speculation and a tangent. So, it's a fine balance to strike when you kill off a character, but even riskier if you decide to bring them back. So when I first heard that Commander Charles Tucker III of Star Trek Enterprise had been resurrected in the Romulan War books, my first thought was, what, really? My second thought was, hang on, Trip died after the Romulan War in 2161, so why is he being brought back from a death he never suffered? So, first off, there's a little wiggle room in canon to allow for this to happen, but at the end of the day, these are books, and Trek has always treated its books as non-canon playgrounds. So it's up to you how much faith of the heart, sorry, faith you place in these events. The wiggle room I am referring to was in fact caused by the controversial choice to place the finale of Enterprise as basically an additional TNG episode, being recreated on a holodeck. Because of the interactive nature of the holodeck, the tale we are told is inherently flawed and incorrect, so there's our tenuous hitching post. So. The books have it that the documented holodeck recording was in fact a cover story, one maintained for centuries as no one really dug into it because section 31. So basically, there are tensions rising between Romulus and the Coalition of Planets in 2155, especially Earth, and Tucker in particular feels the lack of decisive action on the Coalition's part is inviting disaster. I mean, who can blame him, really. He was deeply affected by the Zindi attack and the loss of his sister in 2153, so he's rather antsy while the Romulan threat is growing, having seen firsthand the devastation that interstellar war can bring. As a result, colleague and stiff upper Brit Malcolm Reed gives Tucker a way to contact Section 31, who immediately finds a use for someone of Tucker's adaptability and experience even though he's really not that subtle a character, a, a trait you'd kind of want in a spy. However, he was quite familiar with Romulan tech, so amid many projects the Romulans are running in preparation for conflict with Starfleet, one of which was Valdor's drone mimicry ship, the Romulan Star Empire is attempting to break the Warp 7 barrier. If they could construct a Warp 7 engine, then they would have a major edge in the upcoming conflicts, as the only ships capable of just reaching this FTL speeds were the Vulcans, and they ain't sharing. So, a mission is devised to stall their progress, and it is successful. However, it needed him to fake his death so it could be conducted in secret. This fake-out was not meant to be for long, but things get more complicated during the mission. It's kind of hard to avoid meeting a Romulan or two, and Tucker learns of the shared history of the Vulcan and Romulan people. He therefore agrees to maintain his official status as being dead so as not to invite questioning, 
as section 31, lays out a convincing argument that the knowledge of the Romulan heritage might fracture the coalition before it really has a chance to flourish. Eventually, surgically altered to look like a Romulan and taking gene-altering drugs to even colour his blood, he seizes the opportunity to return home, but ends up being recruited by Vulcan intelligence the Vashar, who want to make use of Trip's experience. There were also several other issues to address, however, as T'Pol came to realise that he was still alive because of their Vulcan psychic connection that tends to form between close individuals, even across light years. Archer also was aware of Trip's survival and complicit in the cover story. Anyway, the Vashar pretty much stumbled across Tucker and decided that having someone who looked Romulan could act convincingly Romulan, because human emotions, and had spent the last few months deep in Romulan territory, well, it was too much of an asset to let go. So before he could ever really get back to Earth, he had more duties to fulfil in the Earth-Romulan War. Meanwhile, Section 31 fabricated this cover story, taking the cause of Trip's fake-out death and displacing it six years to 2161. This would help cover any loose threads and mentions of Tucker being alive that Section 31 might miss, should they attempt to scrub the record entirely. As mentioned, the crew of the Enterprise had developed strong suspicions that he was still around. However, it also creates some errors, such as making it seem as if the crew of the NX-01 haven't changed for its entire tenure. This is where the official record that we see replayed in the holodeck in These Are The Voyages came from. In the books universe, it's mentioned that Tucker in fact adopts an alias at the conclusion of his undercover work and returns to marry to Pol on Vulcan, still all in secret. They go on to have two kids, Lorian and Tamir, and Tucker lives to the ripe old age of 120 while Topol goes on to become a Federation ambassador. It's not until the 2400s that reporter Jake Sisko meets with Captain Nog and the two are poring over declassified Section 31 files that they begin to piece it all together. Nog had been nerding up on 22nd century warp mechanics when he started coming across discrepancies and thus contacted someone to help pull the threads together, his reporter friend. Personally, I think the survival of Trip is implausible, considering the level to which contrivances have to convene to make it so, but honestly, I still prefer this outcome to the unflattering write-off the character received in the shows. But as always, what goes on screen is primary canon, and things from the books are only hazy maybes at best. But that's the point of this series of early Federation videos, to bring you the lore that otherwise gets ignored. Even if it really does strain credulity at times. Thanks for watching this video on the formation of the Federation, and I hope to continue delving into this era on the side with other Star Trek and sci-fi videos. Let me know what you think of Trip's second wind in book form, especially if you've read the books in question. Trip lives or Trip dead? Thanks again, I've been Rick, and goodbye.